Good morning. My name is Robert Lamb. I am a senior fellow here at CSIS and the director of the program on crisis, conflict, and cooperation. Um, our program is celebrating its 10th year this year. Um, we began about 10 years ago with the Commission on Post-Conflict Reconstruction that CSIS did with um, the Association of the U.S. Army. And in May, we'll be doing a public event um, that will be looking back at the last 10 years of reconstruction and stabilization. Um, and of course, more importantly, looking forward at the field. Um, we, uh, there's fierce competition for conference space at CSIS, so we're still working out the date and the details. But um, uh, please keep attuned to that. Um, and I uh, hope you'll be able to attend that. Also on April 12th, um, uh, here in the B1 Conference Center, the full conference center, at 2.30 in the afternoon, um, CSIS is hosting uh, Minister Wardak, Minister of Defense of Afghanistan, and Minister uh, Mohammadi, Minister of the Interior of Afghanistan, uh, for a public event and a discussion about uh, U.S.-Afghan relations and the future of the security transition. Uh, we hope that you'll all attend that one as well. Um, we had handed out a little bit of information about our program and some of our recent and forthcoming publications. I hope you take a look at those as they come out. Um, we are thrilled today uh, to be able to talk about uh, civilian assistance uh, to Afghanistan and uh, the effects that it's had there. We're obviously entering a very difficult period in Afghanistan. Uh, U.S. forces are drawing down. Uh, the forces of our NATO allies are drawing down as well. And what's going to be left over are uh, a lot of civilians, a lot of diplomats, and a lot of development professionals working to uh, hold on to the progress that's been made in Afghanistan over the past 10 years and uh, hopefully forge a path forward so that Afghanistan can continue to stabilize and develop in the years to come. But it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, the security situation is uh, still a bit sketchy. There's questions about how civilian personnel can, uh, can stay safe uh, in the absence of military personnel present um, with the transition from private security companies to the Af Afghan Public Protection Force and many other difficult issues going forward. It is, uh, I'm particularly uh, happy today that uh, Ambassador Hakimi has, um, has joined us this morning. Um, Ambassador Hakimi is the, uh, the uh, Afghan ambassador to the United States. Um, he's also the non-resident envoy to Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and Argentina. Um, he has worked with the Office of the Vice President of Afghanistan. Uh, he's been the ambassador to, to both China and Japan. Um, and he has worked in the, uh, as the Deputy Foreign Minister um, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, working on political affairs there. Um, I'm going to uh, ask Ambassador Hakimi to come up and, uh, and make some comments, and then we'll uh, open it up for an, uh, um, a brief opportunity uh, for some questions and answers. And then after that, we're going to introduce um, Alex, uh, Alex Thier and Abigail Friedman uh, to, to discuss uh, some of the uh, recent work that's been going on in Afghanistan. So Ambassador Hakimi, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Lam, for a very kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much for having me this morning. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, Asia Foundation, USAID, and also CSIS for having me uh, uh, this morning. Um, you may all know that we have made a lot of achievements for the last 10 years or so in Afghanistan, uh, particularly the support that we received from uh, United States uh, among other donors is something that uh, we are grateful. And uh, through the assistance that we received, uh, we have accomplished a lot. Uh, the most recent uh, report uh, from USAID, quite frankly, I found it very uh, detailed and uh, comprehensive that gave you an overall picture of what has been done in Afghanistan in different sectors, mainly in education sector and health sector, and also in energy and telecommunication sector, among all other uh, sectors that we have achieved a lot. You may know that uh, in uh, 2002, less than a million uh, students we had in Afghanistan, but now we have uh, over 8 million, uh, of which 40% uh, or uh, girls. 
uh, in uh, education sector, um, the um, primary access to uh, health care uh, from 8% now, uh, it's, it's increased to 60%. The, um, um, while the mortality rate uh, decreased, now uh, we have the life expectancy rate uh, uh, increased from 45 years to almost 64 years. And uh, uh, the electricity accessibility, which uh, all our population had only 2%, uh, now uh, over 18% of our population have access to electricity, uh, of which 2 million within the capital, they have 24-hour electricity. And uh, also, almost half of our population they have a uh, mobile phone, and they are using mobile phone uh, regularly. Um, our GDP on economic growth in 2002 was 150, while we have uh, right now uh, 530 today. And having said all that, uh, uh, there are a lot of achievements recently, but uh, we need uh, long-term an enduring partnership with uh, our international partners. Um, uh, most recently, we have signed uh, a strategic partnership with our international partners, uh, mainly United Kingdom, with France, with Italy, with India. Uh, there are some other uh, partnership in the pipeline that we will sign, uh, one with United States, uh, also, we uh, will sign with, with Canada and Australia. So uh, all that will uh, n not only help us to rely on our own resources, but also the commitment from our uh, international partners is something that uh, uh, will give uh, uh, um, a confidence to our people and it's, it serves like an assurance policy uh, for us. So. Uh, in order to, uh, to have uh, uh, our own institutions to, uh, mm, uh, to, uh, to rely on their own resources, we have some objectives. Those objectives are that we should build not only a capacity within our own institutions, but we have to bring some reform as well. Uh, strengthening our public financial management is another area that we are focusing a lot. Uh, in order to eliminate corruption, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are working to make our system more transparent and accountable. And among uh, all these, uh, regional cooperation is very important to engage with, uh, with countries in the region uh, and uh, uh, to have a mechanism uh, to, uh, to make Afghanistan to play its, uh, its nature role, which is bridging countries uh, uh, from the region. Uh, we have uh, a national uh, development strategy, which we have uh, laid that uh, in 2008. And based on that, we have uh, created uh, national priority programs uh, in, in Kabul uh, process. So all those national uh, priority programs, now they are focusing on, on uh, 22 projects. And uh, um, uh, those projects recently in uh, Tajikistan, we had fifth RECA conference, which is Regional Economic Cooperation Conference. Uh, there we have uh, presented all those uh, projects. And that's our goal um, to, um, to present that in upcoming Tokyo conference, which is in July of this year. Uh, uh, and uh, the difference between this conference with other conference would be that uh, we will have our donors to focus on, on uh, one project, and from there we will, we will need their, uh, their support. Uh, you may all know that according to World Bank uh, uh, recent report, there will be a, a fiscal uh, gap after the international coalition forces will reduce and uh, draw down. So in order to uh, fulfill that gap, uh, we may uh, need uh, assistance from our international partners for years to come. Uh, so 
Also, you may know that uh, there will be another uh, 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 conference in um, Chicago, uh, which will be NATO Summit in mid-May. Uh, there, uh, we will um, have our uh, leaders to come and we talk about our national security forces, not only the structure, but also uh, 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 their budget uh, for the years to come. So our expectation is that uh, mm, this, um, uh, this summit will give us um, mm, uh, an assurance for, especially for our national security forces uh, budget. And uh, uh, with the USAID, um, as I said, the report, uh, I found it very comprehensive. And I'm glad that now USAID, they're focusing more on what they call foundational investment versus uh, quick impact projects. Um, uh, we have talked with our donors uh, that uh, if they can uh, realign uh, their uh, resources with our uh, needs, um, this is our expectation uh, to, uh, and this is why, how we're gonna talk with our donors uh, in Tokyo conference. Um, there, there were some uh, principles that we have agreed before, um, uh, like uh, Afghan ownership, uh, harmonization, <coughs> mutual accountability, capacity building, and sustainability. Those are the principles that we anticipate from our uh, international donors to stick to those uh, principles that they have all agreed. So. Uh, with that very brief note, I, uh, if I may, I, uh, I stop here. And if you have any question, I'm, I'm willing to, willing to an answer that. So with that note, uh, I, I want to use this opportunity to thanks not only U.S. taxpayers, uh, but uh, uh, U.S. government and also U.S. Congress uh, and uh, uh, USAID as an implementing uh, agency for their efforts, for their support, and uh, their dedication uh, for the last 10 years in Afghanistan. Uh, we couldn't have achieved all that without their uh, support. So we are grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Hakimi. Um, uh, as, as the moderator, I'd like to, to take the, uh, the, the privilege of asking the first couple of questions, sure. if I may. Um, looking forward, we have, the, uh, as you said, the NATO conference coming up in Chicago and the, uh, the conference coming up in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and there's going to be some very important and difficult issues that are going to be addressed at both of those. Um, in Chicago, it's one of the most important is going to be the question of, um, obviously, the, the international uh, forces presence there. Um, and it seems likely to me that uh, there will be a lot of discussions surrounding the, the ability of the Afghan National Security Forces to hold the country together as international forces draw down. The, do you think that the, the current targets for the size and composition of the National Security Forces is realistic, um, given the international community's records so far of, um, of being able to identify the number of trainers and and the resources available to do that. Um, would you find that, uh, that the current plans for the National Security Forces are realistic? And then uh, the second question, looking forward to Tokyo, um, the international community has, let's admit it, a pretty terrible record of um, respecting local ownership and uh, focusing on um, sustainable uh, projects and systems. There's more of a project focus rather than a, a focus on building systems that are, that are sustainable. How confident are you that the international community will be able to, to use the conference in Tokyo uh, to actually take seriously uh, those principles that they've committed themselves to? Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, on the first question, um, in, uh, in Lisbon conference in 2010, we have agreed with our international partners that uh, we, we will have an Afghan national security forces with that structure and with that size. So we all agreed that uh, 352,000 uh, Afghan national security forces will, uh, uh, will be formed. Uh, and uh, by uh, October of this year, we have to hit that target, the uh, total number of 
thousand, uh, and uh, mm, um, uh, if um, the international coalition forces, according to the plan that we have made, uh, will draw down by 2014. Um, mm, uh, so we we are talking with our uh, NATO partners now because, uh, as I said, one of the uh, agenda within uh, NATO uh, summit in Chicago would be about the new structure and also the size of the budget. Uh, that uh, we want uh, uh, our partners to be flexible enough on, on the size, uh, especially because uh, we, um, uh, if the situation would be ideal uh, and we have a peaceful Afghanistan, we may not need uh, a, a big army and big police force. But uh, also, um, for the worst case scenario, you have to have that flexibility. So, um, but we have full confidence on our uh, uh, national security forces that uh, uh, they are capable to, uh, to take the lead and, and defend our country uh, that we have been defending for centuries and centuries. So yes, there are shortage of um, equipment, there are shortage of uh, 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 trainers, and this is something that we have been communicating with our partners from time to time and um, hopefully that, that issue will be addressed there some one way or another. Um, and uh, uh, there will be um, a fixed uh, budget line for that, uh, and from there uh, there will be a portion from our own uh, government, and uh, uh, we anticipate uh, uh, NATO members and other uh, non-NATO members to contribute to that uh, budget. And uh, our expectation is, as usual, that the United States will will give us a big big chunk of that uh, budget. In regards to uh, to Tokyo conference, as you said, uh, this time it will be a project oriented uh, conference. So we have uh, a certain projects that we will present that uh, to donor. And for example, uh, we have uh, uh, railway connectivities. We have made a plan for that. So from there, we, we ask uh, uh, each individual uh, donors, those that they are interested to, uh, to help us in, in that to, to provide us support uh, in this regard. And uh, we are talking bilaterally also with, uh, um, with some of our uh, uh, international uh, donors. And, uh, we have received uh, assurance that gave us uh, uh, gave us reason to believe that we will we will have strong support there. But uh, uh, let's not forget that uh, the security of Afghanistan, one way or another, is uh, it, it's depend on the security on not only in the region but other countries. And I'm glad that uh, at least in in this city, everybody admit uh, this fact now. Um, so uh, we are hopeful that uh, part of those expenditure, military expenditure, uh, while they draw down, they will reinvest uh, in, in Afghanistan development as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have uh, time for about 10 minutes of questions um, because we also have two other speakers that we want to turn to as well. What I would like to ask is that um, when, uh, when I call on you, please uh, state your name. Um, uh, wait for the microphone, actually. Um, it will be brought to you. State your name. Um, a very brief question. Please don't make long speeches, and please limit it to one question. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Sir? Thank you very much. Raghavir Goyal from India Globe and Asia today. My question is that... Uh, uh, President and many nations have just returned from South Korea. They always talk about Afghanistan. Uh, is Afghanistan ready when NATO and U.S. leaves? It's a security question. And second, are you or can you say that Afghanistan is today free of terrorism, Al-Qaeda, and this reconciliation is working, and you don't have any problem from across the border? And finally, once what? Afghanistan was a export country, we <coughs> used to export everything from many items, and today you know where we are, where Afghanistan is. So what happened to your natural resources? Thank you. Thank you. 
On the first part of your question about the security and our national security forces, um, as I said before, uh, in uh, Lisbon of 2010, we have uh, signed a declaration with our NATO partners and non-NATO partners that we have agreed on the transition plan that uh, uh, we should gradually uh, should give uh, the opportunity to Afghan national security forces uh, to take the lead. As you know, we are in the second phase now. Uh, while we should provide them training and also uh, adequate resources that uh, they should be ready. And uh, as I said, we have full confidence, but that uh, according to the uh, schedule that we have already made, they are ready to take the lead. Um, on the second issue about reconciliation, uh, on the overall strategy of fight against terrorism, this is something that we have agreed uh, not only within Afghanistan. We had a peace, peace jerga that for us it's the highest authority um, that all our people anonymously, they, in one voice, they endorsed uh, the plan for the reconciliation, but also our international partners agreed that uh, this is the best way to, to go for. But all the details, how we're going to do it uh, to make sure that uh, uh, not only internally everybody should be on board, but uh, all our partners should be engaged in that process. This is something that uh, we are committed. We are going toward that path. Uh, there are some questions here and there, but uh, once we get to the stage that we will talk about substance, so we will, uh, we will keep everyone informed. In regards to, uh, to our mining and uh, the resources that we have, um, uh, you mentioned about our exports. Uh, exports uh, in the old days, I know that we have sent a lot of exports to other countries. Um, so we are not there yet, but the foundation has uh, established as such that hopefully for the years to come, uh, we will match those numbers, those export number again. But uh, in regards to a mining sector, uh, we are in a very preliminary stage, even though we have uh, given uh, one of our strategic copper mine project to, to a Chinese company. They have invested for more than 3.5 billion US dollar. Uh, we have given another uh, uh, iron ore uh, project to an uh, Indian joint Indian companies and also a Canadian company. And uh, uh, JP Morgan already invested in, in our uh, gold mine. Um, uh, there are some other uh, gas and oil projects in the pipeline that's going through the tendering process. So uh, all in all, uh, even though that will take some time, but uh, we are hopeful that uh, our m once our mining sector will pick up, that would be uh, a resources uh, for us to, to count on. Thank you, sir. Um, why don't we take, um, I'll take two questions, um, and then I'll ask you to answer both of them, if I may. Um, Thank you. Um, Emily Cadet with Congressional Quarterly. Uh, there was a congressional hearing this morning actually about aid in Afghanistan and there are a lot of concerns expressed by the, the two members of the panel who were there about security costs now that Afghans have taken the lead. Um, I was wondering if you could assess how you think the security is performing since that transition point and why you think it's more important to have Afghans in the lead even though it's costing more. And then, um, I'll ask, uh, there to a brief question. Sir, good morning. George Nicholson from Stratcorp. This morning in a briefing at the British Embassy in Kabul, the uh, Foreign Minister of the UK, Alistair Burke, made the comment, quote, if corruption is not addressed, it could completely destroy people's confidence in their own, own country. That's been brought up in some of the congressional hearings, briefing with uh, General Allen on Monday. Again, uh, can you give some kind of insights into the metrics and what's being done to address that? Because in terms of perceptions, that could undermine the whole future of providing support to Afghanistan. Thank you. OK. Are you going to answer the first Please. one? Or? <laughs> <laughs> because that was part of your hearing. Well, uh, 
uh, as I said before, uh, we have defended our countries, our country for years and centuries and centuries. And uh, uh, the resources that we received, and also the support that we received, and as I said in in Chicago, uh, mm, with the plan that we will present to uh, to our partners, uh, we have full confidence that our security forces will be able to to defend not only our country, but they they will be in a strong position to enforce law and order. Um, uh, security situation, if you uh, compare those areas that they have already gone through the transition, and our security forces uh, uh, already took over the responsibility in those areas, uh, uh, quite frankly, those, are, uh, those areas are, are uh, uh, quite, uh, quite now. The situation is much better, including Helmand. But the key for, uh, for a sustainable um, security situation is that we should provide basic services to, to the people. So having said that, all the development projects that we have uh, promised that that was part of the transition package, those need to be implemented also. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the key. In regards to corruption, uh, uh, we as a government, we have always admitted that Afghanistan is not an exception. If you see all other countries, there are corruptions one way or another. So Afghanistan is not immune from, from corruption. But, uh, um, uh, but um, our government, they're, uh, they're uh, uh, committed to fight against this. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, not only uh, made a lot of reforms within the administration, um, uh, our Attorney General Office and also the Chief Justice Office uh, and the police uh, uh, as a law enforcement agency, um, uh, they are pushing this matter through. Um, but it's, it's, it's a process. You cannot eliminate corruption overnight. Uh, there are causes into that. Uh, A, uh, the very low salary of our civil servants, uh, because quite frankly, we haven't able to implement uh, a proper administration system with proper pay and grading system, with proper uh, um, a pension system to give them that assurance, uh, uh, unfortunately. But a lot of things are happening. We are not there yet. Um, also, quite frankly, we were not ready for that much resources that we have in Afghanistan now. And uh, not only within our system, uh, most of the uh, contractors that uh, are functioning in Afghanistan, a lot of corruption is coming from there as well. And um, so uh, it's, it's not a good excuse to say that the corruption, because, because the contractors there, so there should be a corruption. No. We have, we have uh, made a lot of uh, uh, progress to, to make sure that uh, not only corruption should not happen, but, um, but it's, it's a process. It will take some time. Uh, we have uh, uh, arrested some judges uh, in attorney general office. We have prosecutors. We have arrested them. But uh, uh, we don't think that's, that would be the sol solution. So we have to have a proper um, anti-corruption package uh, to provide. And also uh, uh, security and assurance for their future is very important uh, in order to, to deal with the corruption drastically. Thank you. OK. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
um, on behalf of uh, CSIS and our, our co-host for today's event, the Asia Foundation, I'd like to, to thank you, Ambassador Hakimi, um, for being kind enough to come over here and share with us your, your thoughts on these very difficult situations. Um, it's, it's my pleasure um, to introduce um, our two speakers uh, for the remainder of our event this morning. Um, Alex Thier is um, he's the assistant to the administrator um, at USAID and head of the Office of Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs. Um, Alex has been involved with Afghanistan and Pakistan for years, I guess decades is probably the better, um, <laughs> the better metric. Um, he was uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan director at USIP. Um, he uh, spent a good deal of his time in the 1990s uh, traipsing around Afghanistan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's uh, directed a program on uh, state fragility at Stanford, has worked for the International Crisis Group, um, has done work with uh, UK's de uh, Department for International Development, um, and has done uh, uh, legal and constitutional work um, on uh, South Sudan um, you, and with the United Nations in Afghanistan. Um, he's he's uh, a gentleman who, who knows his stuff on Afghanistan, um, and uh, we're very much looking forward to uh, to hearing what he has to say about the uh, um, the effects that um, at least USAID's work in Afghanistan has had. Um, it's also my pleasure um, to introduce Abigail Friedman. Um, uh, Abigail is, uh, she's currently a senior advisor at the Asia Foundation. Um, she's been at the State Department and the U.S. government for, uh, for many years before that. Uh, most recently on the National Security Council's uh, staff as the director of the Afghanistan office, um, although I think you, you had some work on Pakistan as well while you were there. Um, uh, she's uh, spent some time in the field uh, in Afghanistan, north of Kabul, um, uh, doing some work with the brigade there and heading up a few uh, provincial reconstruction teams. Um, she's been posted in Quebec, Tokyo, and Paris, and has worked on North Korean issues, Balkans, um, and Bosnia. Um, she is. Uh, she still has. Uh, I believe you still have some affiliation with the State Department, and and so the uh, the views that that um, that Abigail will be expressing are are hers. They do not necessarily represent the uh, the views of the Department of State. Um, and if I know Abigail, she will certainly express her views. Um, so um, I, um, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Alex, who um, has had the pleasure of just coming to us from that briefing on the Hill. Uh, that happened this morning, um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll provide you some a more pleasant environment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Uh, I'm trying to find a place for my papers there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bob and CSIS, for doing this event. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in this room. Uh, this is one of the rooms in Washington. There's about a half dozen of them where uh, the folks who have been focusing on Afghanistan for at least the last decade have over and over, many of the people in this room, over and over met to, to talk about what's going on. And, and it's actually critical um, that we have this community of people who pay attention, who are critical thinkers, uh, who go in and out of government. Um, uh, I want to so I want to thank CSIS uh, and Asia Foundation uh, for hosting this. Uh, great thanks to Ambassador Hakimi for coming, um, for representing his government so ably, particularly at such an important time. Um, and I also want to thank uh, our staff um, at USAID um, and in particular Heather Sullivan, who I don't see, she'll wave. Uh, back there. Um, the, today uh, is the launch of this report. And uh, everybody should get a copy. It's also going to be available online. And the reason we decided to put out a report um, is that in the last two years that I have been doing this job, um, I have been struck by a couple of things uh, that we really wanted to embody here. And I'll just make some brief remarks about. Uh, the first is that there is a really, truly untold story about Afghanistan, unfortunately increasingly so in the media. Uh, and that is that by some indicators, Afghanistan has made remarkable progress in the last decade. Uh, when you look at it cumulatively, and I'll go to, to cite some of these things, um, but there really are a lot of remarkable stories. And those of you who know Afghanistan, who go back and forth, I was just there 
a couple of weeks ago. I've been in Afghanistan uh, literally every four to six months since the fall of the Taliban. And when you have that kind of view of the progress in the country, the progress that the people have gone through, the economy have gone through, the political system has gone through, um, is really uh, remarkable. And that story is not told enough. And one of the things that I think coming into government from the outside is that we're not effective enough. The US government is not effective enough in telling that story. And you have to tell that story in a way that's credible. Uh, and that means having facts and figures that can demonstrate what was really spent, where did that money go, what were the results achieved, but also, frankly, to say what hasn't worked well. Uh, because we all know those stories are out there, too. I think, in fact, they're told far more frequently um, and disproportionately than the good stories. Uh, but you have to have an honest narrative. And that's what I hope is represented in this report. But you can all look at it and, and judge. Uh, but the other bigger part of the narrative that's going on for me is that when I look at this incredible progress, the other side of that story is that that progress is fragile. Uh, you all, I think, are aware that there is a deep level of uncertainty about Afghanistan through uh, 2014 and beyond. Um, and we collectively, as the international community and the Afghan government together, need to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to safeguard the incredible amount of investment in dollars and human lives over the last decade, to secure that progress that has been made in the face of enormous challenges. And one of the ways that we need to do that is by by, first of all, figuring out what does really work, and again, that's what hopefully part of this report is intended to do, uh, but it's also by making sure that we re remain committed to this purpose. Um, and as somebody who has been involved in Afghanistan literally for 19 years now, um, uh, that's something that I can speak to uh, at a personal level. So. The first thing that this slide shows is all of the U.S. government funding through USAID uh, that has gone to Afghanistan. Um, our overall allocation of funds uh, in the last decade, roughly, um, is, uh, is about uh, $12 billion. And let me frame that in a way that really hits home. It's at a significant amount of money, and I think we have results to demonstrate what that has done. That represents approximately four to six weeks of the military campaign. And so when you look at what we have been able to achieve with those funds and what, why I believe we need to continue at this in a robust way, um, bear that in mind. It would be a terrible time for us to be penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, the other thing that hopefully this report does is, is to, to, to bring transparency. I was one of the people sitting in uh, a think tank, in this case USIP, trying to write reports about what we were doing in Afghanistan and often found it frustrating to find real facts and figures. And so we have made a real concerted effort. If you look at our website, if you look at these types of reports, to be much more transparent about that money and, and where it's going, because that's important. Um, and finally, making some real reforms in how we do business in Afghanistan. That means increasing accountability, um, which is more vetting, frankly, of our programs. It's a much deeper analysis of the cost effectiveness of our programs, where we're having successes um, and where we're not, and getting rid of those pro programs uh, where we're not. Uh, but also really focusing on sustainability. Because if this is going to work, if this transition to greater Afghan sovereignty and lead across the board is going to work, our programs in Afghanistan need to be geared towards sustainability. And that means making the Afghan state more sustainable, and it, makes, it means making our individual projects more sustainable. So this chart is Afghanistan's domestic revenues. Again, it tells a remarkable story. When you look in percentage terms and also in real dollar terms, what the Afghan government has been able to do over the last decade, and particularly in the last three years, to boost their revenues. The fiscal gap that Ambassador Hakimi was talking about is real. And some of that will be made up by donors, but some of it has to be made up by the Afghan government ability uh, to collect revenues. 
So one, they have to have the ability and the will to collect those revenues, and two, there has to be legitimate enterprise from which they can collect those revenues. And we're working on both of those things. <clears throat> um, th this next slide, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this, this next slide um, shows you something that I also think is really important as we think about sustainability. Electricity in Afghanistan has seen remarkable growth. This is one of those stories where a couple of years ago, Kabul was called the dark capital of Asia. You literally would fly over and see nothing at night. The lights were not on, and that obviously pertained to much of the rest of the country as well. So there's a couple of challenges, increasing generation, getting power into the country, but equally important is the number of connections to actually distribute the power to people, because that is also a challenge. And then third, collecting money for that power so that it's sustainable and you can build more of it. This chart shows in even more remarkable fashion that we have gone from 200,000 some electricity connections in 2003, this is not even in 2001, to over 750,000. And we're doing this on a daily basis around the country, even in places like Kandahar, where we have a program to add 50,000 more connections. But equally important is collecting the money. And we have a great partner in DABS, the Afghan Energy Utility. DABS is a remarkable story because, first of all, it didn't even exist a couple of years ago. It has a great leader, and they have taken their revenues from $39 million to $159 million, a four-fold increase in about the last three years. And what is that doing? It's allowing, first of all, the Afghans to be able to pay for the maintenance of their energy system going forward, but it's also giving them the capacity to manage this investment themselves. And that is really one of the most important things that we need to do, because all of this investment has to be carried forward into the future, and it needs to be carried forward by the Afghan government. Um, I realize this one is a little bit beaten to death, but I have to say it because it is so fundamental to Afghanistan's future. In 2001, there were 900,000 boys in school and about 0% of them, uh, of the kids being educated, were girls. Today, there are 8 million Afghan children in school, 35% of them are girls. And you just have to stand back and think about that, what that really means, not only for today and access to education, but what that means for Afghanistan's future. Uh, it is phenomenal. Uh, and assuming we can remain on track, these kids coming out of school, it's, it's, it's going to be revolutionary. It's going to be revolutionary for the next generation of, of women in Afghan society. And it's going to be revolutionary on Afghanistan's ability to get its economy uh, to where it should be. Um, another remarkable story uh, that is not as, told, as much told about the education story is the health care story. Last December, uh, the international community released something called the Afghan, and the Afghan government released something called the Afghan Mortality Survey. This was really, in many ways, the first comprehensive look at Afghan health statistics, and it also gave us a means by which to compare to previous surveys that had been done in previous years. Uh, and we learned a couple of things that were remarkable, that stunned us. Um, by increasing access from about 6% of the population to 60-some percent of the population and giving them, you know, this basic package of health services, which is this path that we went down, instead of trying to build a lot of very expensive, fancy care uh, that would serve few Afghans, we decided to use low-cost strategies to expand access as quickly and dramatically as possible, things that literally for pennies can save the lives of women in childbirth and children under five. And the impact has been equally amazing. Afghanistan's life expectancy has gone up 15 to 20 years in one decade, which is, I believe, probably the single largest increase, at least in that last decade, of anywhere in the world. 
Now, again, you were starting from an incredibly low baseline, one of the lowest life expectancy rates in the world. You were starting from one of the lowest, uh, the worst infant mortality and maternal mortality rates in the world. But these have plummeted. Now, they're still at alarming levels in terms of the long-term health of Afghan society, but that difference that we were able to make, and the critical thing to understand about the healthcare system is that we did this by co-investing in the Afghan government. The Ministry of Public Health was one of our first what we call on-budget programs, where we said, you know what, we're not going to only pay NGOs and for-profit companies to do this work. We're going to use them as partners, but we're going to work through the Afghan government so that they can set the national policies and they can build their capacity. Uh, and, and the results have been unmistakable and remarkable, and I should say they have been accountable. Uh, there have not been concerns about those funds going into the Afghan government because we set a very high bar in the beginning for making those sure, sure those funds were going into the right place. Um, Mobile phones is this other amazing story. Afghanistan goes from very few uh, connections to an enormous amount of connections. 85% of Afghans today live in an area that's accessible to a mobile phone. 60-some percent actually directly access the mobile network. This has revolutionized communications in Afghanistan, and it is starting to impact other things as well. We are looking at it as a public health information delivery device in a place like Afghanistan where people are not on the internet. We are working on mobile banking. 3% of Afghans have a bank account. That means that, first of all, Afghans aren't saving, and second of all, they're not participating in the formal economy. So if you were to do with banking what happened with communications and giving all of those Afghans access to a bank account through their mobile phone, you would revolutionize financial access in the ways that we've done for education and communications and healthcare. And we're working together um, with the tele major telecommunications companies in Afghanistan to make that a reality. It exists today, but it has to scale up dramatically. <laughs> The other thing that um, I, I really want to underscore is that at the end of the day, we are in, Afghanistan is our largest mission in the world. And we are in Afghanistan because we believe as a government that our assistance efforts are deeply tied to our overall national security efforts. The link between the economic and political health of Afghanistan and the security transition and the drawdown of our forces is very, very strong. To flip that over, the link between a rapid or dramatic decline in our ability to work with the Afghan government to grow the economy and provide services will be destabilizing through the transition. And so we really believe that it is our mission to make this transition successful by not only maintaining these great gains that we have made over the last decade, but by increasing them. And the ways in which we believe that they will be increased uh, are threefold, and these are our priorities going forward, and I'll, I'll end here uh, with a great quote from the President. Economic growth, getting people working, getting Afghanistan trading with its neighbors instead of having conflict with its neighbors, and getting more revenues into the government of Afghanistan's coffers is really in many ways our principal objective going forward. The Afghan economy needs to continue growing. It has grown at 8 to 10 percent over the last decade, which is terrific. But we need to keep that going, and we need to mitigate the consequences of the, of the economic drawdown. As part of that, agriculture, and particularly a focus on food security, is going to be essential. Afghanistan is one of the most food insecure countries on Earth. And as we saw this year, drought continues to plague it. Uh, but we know how to address those issues. Focusing on food security is also going to get more people working because it's 75% of employment is in the agriculture sector. 
it's also going to get more people trading because Afghanistan's chief exports historically have been agricultural. And even though we are hopeful in the future that other small industries and the extractive industries will be a major source of trade for Afghanistan, today and through the next few years, it's really going to focus on agriculture. The second area is in governance. Uh, Afghanistan has to continue its progress towards successful and accountable democratic governance. We have an election coming in 2014 at the same time as the transition, which is going to be absolutely essential for stability. We also have other growing institutions like the parliament, uh, Human Rights Commission, High Office of Accountability. All of these mechanisms that we know from our experience are essential to maintain the checks and balances that will make good government work. But Afghanistan's government also needs to, to be vertical. Afghanistan has a great subnational governance plan and, and is working with the provincial governors in particular to make that a reality. Uh, if you know Afghanistan, you know that the action is really at the local level, and Afghanistan's government at the local level really needs to be there in a robust way for security, economic, and political reasons going forward. And the third area is really Afghanistan's people, what we're ultimately there for, and continuing to invest in human capital development, both to keep and maintain these investments in health and education that have been so critical but also looking at things like workforce development. Um, Afghanistan can't have the economy it wants uh, with the level of education and illiteracy and skills that its, that its people currently have. Uh, we need to enable them to build those skill sets so that they can increasingly grow uh, and, and make these promises of their economic future a reality. Um, so I, I want to end there. Uh, thank you all again for, for coming today. Um, and I just want to reiterate that uh, maybe it's where I, I come from, but we really encourage um, and ask for an open dialogue uh, because I think that's the only way that we collectively can both understand properly what's going on, um, but to ultimately maintain a commitment uh, to all of the critical work that we've been able to do together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Abigail Friedman. Sure. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and uh, honored to follow these two um, excellent speakers. Ambassador Hakimi, it's wonderful to see you again. Alex Tier, um, I want to thank you for all the hard work you're doing. I know uh, how hard it is and uh, your commitment. And uh, Bob, thank you so much for bringing us all together to talk about uh, what is truly one of the most important issues we have going forward. Um, I just want to highlight a few things. I think we've had some excellent uh, discussions, and I know that you have questions. Uh, my remarks will focus on uh, Afghan perceptions and then also a little bit about what the Asia Foundation has learned in its uh, long uh, time working in and uh, with Afghanistan. The Asia Foundation uh, has been in Afghanistan since 1954. In 1979, uh, during the Soviet invasion, uh, the, Af the Asia Foundation moved its offices to Peshawar, where it worked with refugees, uh, focused a lot on education issues, um, continued to work, and then in 2002 uh, came back to Afghanistan to continue doing uh, the work that it began in 1954. Um, so let's start with what the Afghans themselves are saying about their situation, how they assess development efforts. Many of you here, I know, have already um, seen the Afghan survey, have heard of it. Uh, this is a survey that is uh, done by the Asia Foundation. It's been done since 2004. Um, it's kind of heavy, so I only brought this one, but it's available online, and there are some uh, there are some summaries in the back uh, later if you uh, have questions. Uh, what I wanted to tease out, though, is how uh, is Afghan perceptions of uh, development um, in 2011. 
the bottom line is that while they perceive Afghans uh, who have responded to the survey, uh, I should add that the survey is about a little over 6,000 uh, Afghans surveyed across all 34 provinces. Um, and the survey took place uh, summer of 2011. Um, the bottom line is that while Afghans perceive security as their biggest problem, satisfaction is increasing regarding access to education, clean drinking water, health services, and a growing confidence in the role of Afghan institutions. The majority reported satisfaction with the availability of most basic services, including education for children, 73%, water for drinking, 70%, mobility, and availability of clinics and hospitals at 57%. Nearly half were satisfied with the availability of water for irrigation. Least satisfaction was uh, regarding the availability of jobs, 70% uh, not satisfied, and electricity supply at 65%, um, which tracks a little with uh, where we see we need to work um, in the days ahead. Uh, in 2011, more people reported an annual improvement across all areas of economic well-being than in previous years, except for electricity. Uh, let me touch on uh, women. Um, the, uh, the problems, what were perceived as major problems uh, for women are education and illiteracy. Um, and at the same time, 85% of respondents uh, support equal educational opportunities for women. Uh, support for women being able to work outside the home uh, fell um, over the past five years with 35% of respondents believing that women should not be able to work, should not work outside the home at all. Uh, another interesting um, result uh, return from the survey is rep respondents uh, demonstrated or revealed a growing confidence in their own institutions. Um, 67% uh, express confidence in their provincial government and 62% in their parliament. Uh, I just want to end this part by saying, of course, to reiterate that the big issue uh, for Afghans is security. And uh, Ambassador Hakimi mentioned this at the outset as well. Um, when asked what the biggest problem was in Afghanistan, over one third cite insecurity, followed by unemployment, corruption, and then poverty, poor the economy, and lack of education. The next thing I want to touch on is what has the Asia Foundation learned um, since uh, these years that uh, we have been working in Afghanistan. Um, what I'd like to do is sort of go to principles. Um, so I would, I just ticked off some of the principles that, uh, that I think um, are most important for everyone to be aware of. Uh, first is to be in it for the long haul. Um, this is uh, not uh, quick work, uh, pick and shovel work. Um, small scale is good. Uh, don't exceed capacity, um, either your own as an NGO uh, or the local environment. Um, the risks of exceeding your own capacity is that you won't be able to monitor results um, and you won't be able to see when adjustments need to be made and the risks of exceeding the capacity of uh, the local environment uh, are many, and one of which is sustainability. Um, go local, align with local priorities and with local partners. Uh, the Asia Foundation, like many uh, NGOs, I have to say, uh, this isn't just uh, a plug here about the Asia Foundation, this is drawing on our experience, but, but really work with local partners, um, the Asia Foundation does work with local partners on just about uh, every one of its uh, projects and programs. Um, this, too, is key to sustainability. Um, the number of uh, civil society, uh, local Afghan NGOs um, in Afghanistan is uh, soaring. It's a wonderful thing. Um, uh, more and more uh, when in Afghanistan you hear Afghan civil society speaking up, not the international civil society representative speaking up. Um, that is a great uh, growth. Um, in fact, I just wanted to say, uh, I was at another conference a while back and I was talking to an Afghan and I, I said, oh, it's wonderful to see all this Afghan civil society. And he turned to me, he was an Afghan and he said, 
Afghan civil society has always been there. The difference is that you're now here with us. And I, I thought that was a really uh, important thing to keep in mind. Um, be aware of all stakeholders. Uh, recognize the links between security, development, and the political landscape. Uh, another way of uh, phrasing this is inclusiveness. Um, it's often easy to just work with the stakeholders that uh, one has a connection with or that one feels is most receptive. But, um, but for sustainability, for success, uh, for really empowering uh, the people who, uh, Afghans who are going to lead this and are leading this, uh, one really has to be aware of all the stakeholders and uh, work uh, with all of them, uh, seek to mitigate um, uh, um, those who are not supportive of efforts. Um, Another one is um, bottom-up married with top-down. Um, one needs to work with the uh, national institutions, uh, IDLG. Uh, the Asia Foundation has worked um, uh, very closely in support of the IDLG's efforts. One also has to work at the local level. Um, that means, for example, uh, helping uh, provincial governors. Uh, there is the provincial... Um, uh, based Governors Fund uh, is an example of um, helping governors have, uh, have money for operational expenses and to do community works. Um, if it is only the international community that has money to do good works in a province, um, you're not helping build a sustainable uh, state structure. So to have uh, um, uh, a small amount of money for uh, provincial governors to be able to assist with local community projects is, is a classic example of how one begins to help uh, Afghans connect with their government. Um, I think I said this, but I'll say it again. Take the local context as the starting point. Um, this, uh, I want to refer back to the Busan High-Level Forum on Aid Effectiveness because that was one of the key points that came out of Busan. Um, even as we, who have been working on Afghanistan, uh, focus on Afghanistan, it's important to note that the international aid community is also growing and learning and setting out uh, and learning from places like Afghanistan, from uh, where work is being done around the world to see what is effective and what isn't. And um, uh, working within the local context, aligning one's efforts uh, with local priorities is key. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, my last one is do no harm, and then I put in parentheses try, because um, if, we, if we didn't go out of the starting gate, unless we were 100% sure we would do no harm, um, it would be like parenting. No one would have kids, <laughs> right? So it's just um, something that one, one has to do one's best at. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abigail. Um, one of the things that's nice about, um, about the USAID report um, is exactly as Alex said, um, it, it sh has the data there that shows the progress that has been made. Um, it's, it's very easy um, to forget uh, when, we, when we start thinking about um, you know, the level of development in Afghanistan and the level of capability of the Afghan government that 10 years ago the place was basically a medieval theocracy. Um, and if there's, there, if there's one uh, principle that comes out um, when you when you read the literature um, and research worldwide on on development of uh, governance uh, institutions is that they take a really really long time. Uh, in 2003, Afghanistan's GDP per capita uh, per capita was something along the lines of what the United States GDP per capita was in 1700, um, and what the UK's was in around 1500. Um, to, to go from 2003 um, to where we are today, um, the GDP per capita is still low. <laughs> um, and, but we can't expect that it's going to get anywhere near um, what we believe it should be today. One of the things that you, that you um, hear when you read about Afghanistan is uh, about the corruption of the government, um, the corruption of uh, well any aspect of, of society in Afghanistan. Um, you hear about $4 billion leaving the Kabul air airport last year and $8 billion leaving by foot and car. Um, the, uh, 
these are the sorts of things that, that makes it easy for a lot of Americans to get um, a bit cynical about the prospects um, over the next few years in the transition. Um, if you have a government that, that, that can't function um, the way we think it should function, if you have um, uh, that level of corruption and a society who's basically ex, um, expatriating money um, rather than circulating it within it, um, how can we be hopeful that, um, that Afghanistan will stabilize as international forces and resources draw down. Um, I say this because the, um, the, the, partly because I want to, to re reiterate um, the point that Alex made, that progress has been made in Afghanistan. Um, the, the increases in the numbers are pretty steep. Um, but Afghanistan was starting from a really low point. And there's, there's no way that we can really expect that in the next two years, uh, even if we do everything perfectly, uh, that Afghanistan is going to function the way uh, we think it should function. One of the questions that I'd like to pose to, um, to both of you um, before we turn it over to the audience is given that uh, the government's not going to, um, it's not going to have all of its accountability mechanisms in place. It's not going to be able to battle corruption. Um, the independent director for local governance is not going to fully implement the subnational governance policy. Um, these things aren't going to happen according to the, the current plans. Um, the Kabul commitments from a year and a half ago, so, so few of them have actually been achieved um, that I, I think it's unrealistic for us to, uh, to expect that the government's really going to be able to, um, uh, uh, to maybe carry all of the water we expect it to. Um, both of you know this. I've, I've talked with you um, about this. Um, and, but um, there's still a need to, to do this work. And so what I want to ask both of you is, um, how do you overcome those challenges? Um, the, the, the plans that we have in place um, might not go as well as we think they're going to go. Um, what effect can we actually expect that to have? Um, is it reasonably large? Is it large enough? Is it small? Um, does it matter if it's only small? Um, so, would you care to comment on that very general um, question? Um, yeah, I, I, just a few comments. One of the things that um, comes out of the survey that is so interesting is that the first that over half of the respondents uh, of the Afghan survey this past year said that corruption is a problem. Um, more uh, find it uh, a problem, perceive it as a problem at the national level than at the local level. But the, the more interesting thing for me is how these numbers have stayed stable for the last five, four or five years, which suggests how difficult a problem it is to root out. Um, uh, corruption uh, is not perceived as getting worse. It's not perceived as getting better. It's just there. Um, the good news for, for uh, a place like the Asia Foundation is that um, is that uh, that gives us the time we need to just keep working at this. Ultimately, um, corruption is going to be um, uh, addressed, uh, overcome by uh, the Afghans, and that's going to require a civil society that um, can, uh, can insist on more transparency. Um, that's going to uh, require work from the Afghan government, um, but it's, it's gonna be a long haul. Um, you know, just uh, in January and February, um, USAID did what we bureaucratically call a portfolio review. Um, but what that means in reality is that we examined every single project that we have in Afghanistan through a few lenses. Is it cost effective? Is it sustainable? Is it producing results? Is it aligned with the Afghan government's uh, priorities? Um, and I think the answer to your question is that we really need to be very realistic, both about what is accomplishable and what our resources are going to be and who our partners are going to be. Because the good news story is that when we have good partners and we have a reasonable program with some time horizon, we can do great things. Uh, one of the things I loved about Abigail's 
principles, you know, is that trying to do things that you can't accomplish both makes you fail, but then it also makes people believe that you can't succeed. And uh, it's critical that we don't set ourselves up in that way. Um, Afghanistan has made great progress, but it's great progress for one of the poorest countries on earth that has gone through decades of conflict. Uh, and the reality is that if we can, I mean, if I had to grind down to one little tiny nub what we need to be doing in Afghanistan, it is basically sustaining the gains that we have made over the next decade through the next ch challenging few years of transition. Um, Congress has not always been friendly to USAID, um, and uh, they might not be uh, in the years to come. Um, do you fear that, that your budget might be cut too far to be able to do any good? Um, and uh, that's question one. And um, question two, um, going back to the, the issue of, of doing development in a place where violence is a real issue, um, with uh, private security companies uh, being, shall we say, transitioned into the Afghan uh, Public Protection Force, and open questions about whether, whether the Protection Force will actually be able to function um, make it an open question uh, as to you know, what might come of the uh, uh, um, you know, development efforts. Uh, you, you know, obviously, the Special Inves uh, um, Investigator for Afghan Reconstruction um, has recently said that, that a lot of USAID projects are at risk for exactly this reason. Um, I know you were um, fired upon this morning um, by, by the House um, on uh, questions related to this, um, so I'd like you to comment on this. Sure. Um, so you raise two different, um, I think, very important issues. Um, I believe that Afghanistan requires strategic patience. Uh, I believe that our civilian investment in Afghanistan is critical for the success of transition, and this would not be the time to diminish that drastically. Um, and. As I said on the flip side of that, I believe that if you were to do so, you have to do so understanding that that is going to increase the fragility of the transition. So if that's the decision that's made, um, that you will, it will, it will make things more fragile. Um, to the second question, um, the, I think the really good news story about uh, the transition from private security contractors to the APPF is that when this process started 18 months ago, when President Karzai issued the decree, um, we set about examining our program and seeing how we could diminish reliance on armed guards, period, whether they're private contractors or provided by the Afghan government, that it's expensive, uh, which takes money, it gives it to security instead of to the development purposes that we want every possible dollar to go to, um, and it's it and it, it it's you know it it has brought on so many different types of challenges that if we can reduce our overall reliance, that should be one of the first things that we're doing. And we've made dramatic gains in the last 18 months in terms of the number of projects that we fund that require the services of armed guards. So that is a really important change. Um, for those that continue to require um, armed guards, um, we have been working day and night with the Afghan government, with NATO, and with uh, our partners to make sure that there would not be disruptions to what we believe are our critical services. Um, and what I'm happy to say is that as of today, of the 32 projects that USAID funds, that require, that have said that they require APPF because that's the decision of the implementing partners. 23 of those have contracts and are utilizing the APPF and nine of them are in negotiations. And so as of today, there is not a single project that we have that, that our partners anticipate shutting down as a result of this transition. I can't predict the future, but I can say that it has gone a hell of a lot better than we thought it was going to go six months ago.
Thanks. I didn't say hell in front of the Congress. <laughs> <laughs> you probably thought Just in case you're words. worried, Mom, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, Abigail, you listed a number of, of uh, principles that are, are certainly sound um, when it comes to doing development work um, in these sorts of environments. Um, and of course, as you uh, also well know, uh, you know people have been um, shouting that we need to be following these sorts of principles for, for years. There needs to be local ownership. There needs to be sustainable. Um, you know, you need to marry top down with bottom up. Um, the uh, obviously a lot of frustration <laughs> among those um, uh, who who study you know, the effects of civilian assistance because um, the the outcome is almost always well. You know, we need to do more of this sort of thing. Um, I wanted to ask you um, two questions as well. Um, one. What's your understanding of, of the source of that repeated failure by so many international um, civilian uh, agencies to actually follow that, um, the, the mandates to, um, to actually let Afghans lead, to actually um, uh, let Afghans do things their way, um, as opposed to coming in and, and sort of uh, you know, burying them with money and burying them with projects that have not been designed by Afghans and, and so on and so forth. Um, but then the other question has to do with your, your issue of the focus on the local. Um, the, uh, as I said earlier, the, the progress on, on, on governance is, is slow anywhere, um, including in Afghanistan. Um, it doesn't seem to me that we can be particularly confident that, that local government in Afghanistan is really going to be capable enough to, um, uh, to oversee development projects, to, to uh, bring in the resources, to, to pay for them, and so on. Uh, local politics, in all likelihood, is going to continue to be dominated by local strongmen and uh, power brokers and all, all the names that we, we put on people like that. Given that, um, those sorts of, of people are not likely to disappear anytime soon, what does that imply for, um, for our ability to work at the local level um, and improve development outcomes? Uh, thanks. Well, for the first question, I, I mean... Boy, there are a lot of challenges, one of which is that there are just so many actors um, that uh, go into a place like Afghanistan, which uh, has uh, where the needs are so great and where the, um, uh, the desire by the Afghans for help is great, um, that how you coordinate all the different kinds of actors. Um, and then you might have uh, one group that specialty is in um, one aspect of healthcare. So are you going to say, well, no, actually don't come in yet because we don't have this other stuff done? Or are you going to say, well, okay, that's <laughs> that was needed, let's, let's work on that. So, um, uh, so there is no, uh, the reality of um, development, um, as in diplomacy, defense, all three of these things that work together is that uh, there is not one agent that controls the whole thing. Um, so I think that's one of the, the challenges. I think that uh, what, what the international community and the developing countries are trying to do, if I understand correctly from Busan, is first for the, um, uh, the international community to donors to uh, strive to work together uh, as best as possible. And then also uh, with uh, the countries that are recipients um, to identify uh, priorities so that uh, donors can come in and have a sense of what the priorities are. Um, it's an imperfect uh, process. Um, the other question you had on the, uh, if I understood correctly, the, um, the reality that a lot of the uh, local institutions are not uh, where they need to be yet, and so how do we handle that? Um, uh, I think that things are, uh, there's a lot going on in Afghanistan, as, as Alex was saying. I mean, there are a lot of success stories there, and one of them is the National Solidarity Program, which uh, was something that was um, uh, uh, organized by the MRRD, I believe, um, the Ministry for what is it? Rural Rehabilitation and Rural Rehabilitation and Development, um, and basically uh, uh, went to each community and said um, uh, to the community, um, you all identify as a community what uh, development project your local community needs, and uh, we will um, 
uh, provide you with the resources to achieve that, and you all are going to build it, take care of it, do whatever you need. Um, that was a great success. So that's an indication that we are not dealing with a country that cannot do anything, that does not have institutions that um, can, uh, that has institutions that are effective, that most importantly has, uh, one of the things that was most striking in my year when I was living in Afghanistan is the, uh, the natural democracy that one sees at the local level in Afghanistan. Um, it took me completely by surprise to show up at Ashura and you hear every opinion under the sun articulated in a small a village has an issue to address and um, uh, very strong differing opinions are expressed out loud in a small community group. This is not, I had expected a much more intimidated feel. Uh, so, so you have a natural democracy at the uh, local level. Um, you have some institutions and some programs that have been able to succeed. The challenge is how do you scale up? And um, th that is a big challenge that with the National Solidarity Program, uh, one found that very quickly you could get uh, local communities to identify projects to work on. When one went to the next level of trying to get a region or several communities together, it was a lot harder. Um, I'm giving you a long answer <laughs> to your question, but basically um, th this is a lot more complex than uh, a yes, no answer, good, bad. Thanks very much. Let's open it up for some questions. I'm gonna take three questions. Um, please state your name, ask a single question, and please keep it very brief. Thank you. Uh, wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself. Yeah, my name is Kami but I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And uh, honestly, I feel proud of uh, how my dollar, tax dollar is working in Afghanistan to educate children. And I appreciate that you guys have devoted your lives for this purpose. Not only US, but I feel proud of India as well. That is investing billion of dollars in infrastructure. But my question is about, let's call it a Joe Biden theory that somehow we are destroying Pakistan in order to make Afghanistan and so much for our manipulation that, uh, you know, people, average Pakistani think that USAID is nothing but a bribe to give it to these Pakistani corrupt generals, but Mr. 10% and all the people who are ruling that country. And we are, as a taxpayer, I feel really very sad in that my taxpayer is going to these idiot corrupt Pakistanis and it's coming right back I could tell, I mean, I don't have question, time, sir. but I can tell you the name of the people, retired general and bureaucrat Pakis who are buying big properties here. So, I mean, are we, okay, my question is, is Joe Biden, Joe Biden right that we are making a 180 million people, I'm exaggerating a little bit in my question, we are making 180 million people, Pakistani, our enemy, just to build Afghanistan. Thank you very Thanks. much. Um, second question. Um, let's go to the woman in the back there, please. Thank you um, for your presentation. Um, I guess this would be for yeah, Alice. I'm sorry, could you identify Oh, sorry, Elise Thanks. Labbitt with CNN. Thanks. Um, this question is for Alex, but maybe Abigail wants to jump in. You talk a lot about sustainability um, and about the Afghan government, but I'm wondering just in general terms about the actual capacity of the Afghans to sustain these programs once you leave. You know, for instance, you've built a lot of roads, you've built a lot of schools, you've built a lot of health clinics. Do you have the human capacity in Afghanistan to be able to sustain this and the training once um, the U.S. starts to draw down um, its civilian presence? I know you'll have a civilian presence there for a long time, but, I mean, certainly it won't be at the level that um, the Afghans need over the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and final question here in the front. Thank you. My name is Hassan Suresh from the Embassy of Afghanistan. I have a very quick point and a quick question. Um, when we are talking about aid effectiveness, the key component is direct support to Afghan budget. Uh, well, in principle, uh, the commitment is there on the part of the uh, in, uh, international community. Um, but uh, uh, practically speaking, um, most of our uh, donors uh, call for improved capacity before they uh, release funds to our uh, line ministries. 
Uh, while we do recognize a shortage of capacity in our ministries, we believe that um, it is very difficult to improve capacity uh, without utilizing uh, the Afghan systems. So we hope that um, our key donors uh, will uh, increasingly recognize this fact uh, in the future. And my question is on the uh, aid predict predictability. Um, uh, as Ambassador Akimi explained earlier, uh, we are now uh, planning to present our key national priority programs to the Tokyo conference. And uh, as you know, most of these programs are multi-year programs and it's very difficult to count on, on uh, one-year commitments uh, on the part of uh, key donors in terms of programming. Apart from uh, um, international funds that are being created now, uh, my question is to Alex. Uh, as an ex expert dealing with uh, international assistance to Afghanistan, uh, what do you think, what would be the best modality or mechanism to, to, to be put in place to address this problem in the future? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, how about Alex and Abigail? Sure. Thanks for the easy questions. Um, uh, on, on Pakistan, um, I, I just want to step back because I think that one of the most important things to say in this arena, as always, is that Pakistan and Afghanistan will not be stable if their relationship is not stable and if each other is not stable. Um, Pakistan um, is absolutely essential to Afghanistan's development as its primary trading partner, um, as its partner in so many things. Um, finding a way to transition that relationship to be primarily based on positive aspects of the relationship, I think, is one of the most important things we can do over the next couple of years. So increasing trade, um, increasing uh, exchanges at the practical level, uh, working on border security um, so that there is uh, mutual security in terms of the border um, and what goes on in and around the border. All of these things are essential. Um, I think that um, Afghanistan's, our ability to get to uh, a, a, a ultimate political settlement in Afghanistan, a peaceful resolution of that conflict is also very heavily dependent on the positive participation of Pakistan. Um, the United States is very concerned and very involved and we can have a different session to talk about our, our work in Pakistan. Um, but one of the things that I just want to say, uh, because it's so important, in 2013, Pakistan has, or by early 2013, Pakistan has its first ever opportunity to make a transition from a democratic civilian government to a democratic civilian government. In 2014, Afghanistan has its first ever possibility to make a peaceful transition of power from a democratic government to a democratic government. I believe that both of those transitions are fundamental to getting at some of the issues that you're that your question raised. Um, Elise, this question of capacity, which also came up in the statement from, from uh, my friend and colleague, Mr. Sarouche, is, is absolutely fundamental. Um, and uh, the answer to your question is that capacity has grown tremendously. When I look at where the Ministry of Public Health, uh, where the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development that runs the NSP, uh, where uh, the the Afghan energy utility have come just in the last few years, it gives me enormous hope that the Afghans are going to be able to sustain some of these investments. But that does not cut across all areas. Um, at the moment, I remain very concerned about roads. We have invested heavily in roads, but there is not yet an independent, fully capacitated Afghan authority to maintain those roads with a revenue source that will also allow them to maintain those roads. So there's still work to be done, but, but I am very buoyed by the fact that we have some real models of success. Um, and I think that we've learned a lot about how to build those, which brings me to Mr. Sarush's question. He's exactly right. You can't say build the capacity in the abstract and when you have it, we'll come and work with it. 
creating that capacity is actually a process of working through it. And so one of the best things that we have done, in my opinion, and this comes back in part to the National Solidarity Program, but not only, the Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund is a trust fund that was established that is co-managed by the Afghan government and the World Bank. And it does several things. First of all, it creates a pool of funds for the Afghan government to do development work and in some ways deals with part of the challenge of aid predictability because it creates a little bit of a longer term horizon on funding, which is essential for development. It also has very stringent accountability mechanisms because it's a dual key system uh, and billions of dollars have gone through this that have gone through Afghan government channels. They're very heavily audited and it has not raised concerns, but it has also allowed us a vehicle by which to invest directly through the Afghan government so that they have the practical experience of budgeting and budget execution, which at the end of the day is what government does on a practical level. Um, and so that mechanism has been tremendously successful in helping us to understand how to both build capacity as we go along, uh, but also to keep our Kabul conference commitments and at the same time make sure that we're accountable to U.S. taxpayers for where those funds go. So I think that there's a good model and we need to continue to apply that to the other areas uh, that, that still require that capacity to be developed. Uh, that I want to end with that by saying that, you know, there is only one path to success in Afghanistan, and it is Afghan sovereignty. That is the only way that all of us and all of this investment is going to succeed in the long term. And I am gratified, frankly, by transition and the fact that it has finally focused us, the Afghans, the international community, on the need to make this sustainable in the long term. Thanks, Alex. Abigail. I'm actually good. I don't have anything else to yeah. add <laughs> to that one, so uh, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Okay, great. Um, well, um, Alex and Abigail, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ambassador Hakimi, um, although he, I know he had to leave. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the Asia Foundation for, for co-hosting the event today. Um, and finally, thanks to all of you for coming, and we hope to see you in uh, future events. Thanks. <laughs>